Good evening. Welcome back again. It's uh, me, Selena Carty, uh, founder of Black Poppy Rose. So we are here live on Instagram on Monday, the 20th of July. Um, today's topic is women at war. So this, this image, hi Charlene, this image would have been circulating social media and we're going to quickly go through Welcome everyone, we're going to quickly go through the 16 women here. So bear in mind, there are only 16 women here. This doesn't exhaust women in our history. By far, does this, this, these, do these images not exhaust women in our history? Um, but we're going to talk about them in our 30 minute session today. Um, you can find us on all social medias, Black Puppy Rose, um, on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um... If you have any questions, do write them to me and I will um, try and answer them on the next live before we start. So in this time, I will spend answering questions. Um, so if you have any questions from today or on the topics that we're going to be talking about next week, please add your questions here um, or send them to Black Poppy Rose or email them info at Black Poppy Rose and I will endeavour to answer them on the next live or email you a response depending on how the question comes. Um, but my intentions are to start answering questions because um, that's been the feedback over the last two weeks. So I hope that I'm glad that you've come back. Thank you for joining me again. Um, and I hope that you are able to take something away from you with you today. So we're going to make a start. So I don't know how many of these women that you have ever seen or known or heard of, but these are women who have been documented in our history of doing significant things. Well, you know, you say to yourself, what does it mean to do something significant? But I guess just to exist um, leads to something significant. But these women are noted in history for doing a lot of things. So the first thing I wanted to break down today was the meaning of war. So when I so when we do Black Poppy Rose, Black Poppy Rose uh, looks at wars on different levels. We don't just look at armed conflict. So the meaning of war, it, three meanings that I took out today to share with you was a state of armed conflict between different countries or different groups within a country. Second meaning, a state of competition or hostility between different peoples or groups. The third, a sustained campaign against an undesirable situation or activity. So these are three different meanings for war. And under Black Poppy Rose, we tackle all of those areas. So we're going to go through many of these areas with these women that we're going to be talking about today so the first woman this is queen Inzinger, born in 1583 died in 1663 so queen Inzinger is a phenomenal winger for phenomenal winger phenomenal woman um and one that i take a lot of reference from in regards to how i go about myself as an african um identifying woman um, and she's from the region that we now know of, know as Angola, but her tribe was Ndogo at the time. And at the time, the Portuguese had been um, trying to gain control of that region. And she was at war with them for 40 years to keep her people out of slavery and to try and keep um, the peace between Portugal and her people in the regions. However, Europeans, their mission has been for many, many years to take over the entire planet. And that's what, what was happening systematically. And the Portuguese started when they started circumnavigating Africa in the latter part of the 1400s. And the history that we are able to draw from highlights this phenomenal queen fighting against them, um, adapting to their religions, changing her name so she could be uh, versatile in regards to her arguments and her disciplines. Also um, marrying into different tribes, so the Matamba tribe she married into, to also gain more allies and unions to be able to fight this fight that she went on to continue to fight for 40 years. Um, there's a film about Queen Inzinger, how uh, Tony Warner from Black History Walks, he um, showcases films in the uh, BFI in... Uh, on in the BFI British Film uh, Institute, um, I think it's in Waterloo. I'm from London. I've been there several times. But he showcased his film a few years ago, and it was snowing. But we went. Um, but that film is out there and available. So her story is being narrated for people to learn on film. Um, but her history is a phenomenal one in regards to her determination, her power, her drive, her vision. Because a lot of a lot of us as women 
are made well we live in a society we live in a patriarchal existence in society that has always made the woman feel that she is less than that she is second of or she doesn't have a voice because remember at the beginning women couldn't vote we were supposed to stay at home and look after the children and accept whatever was being bestowed upon us but we look at these women in our history who have done above and beyond from what was expected of them and we continue to have and we continue to be that woman um, of today so we draw from the woman of yesterday to say that we are not alone we are not by ourselves and we're not um d fighting these fights for the first time they are fights that continue in every generation and it's up to us to decide how we're going to move ourselves forward and empower ourselves and each other to move forward to do this this is queen and zinger the next woman here is Nanny of the Maroons, born in 1686 to 1755. And she is noted to be coming from West Africa because Nanny is a title found in uh, the Ashanti region in uh, West Africa, which now be to today we call Ghana or was the Gold Coast before then. But she was involved in the Maroon Wars in Jamaica. So the Maroons were classified as a people who were um, savages, so the Sima Maroons was a title for them because they were always waging war and they weren't seen to be giving up. So when uh, Britain were continuing to try and take more land because they'd already come and taken over uh, Jamaica from the Spanish, uh, they could, wanted to continue to take land, but the Maroons wouldn't allow them to take their lands. So they continue to fight. And she's noted for uh, fighting guerrilla warfare, which is using the land, lay of the land, tactical uh, maneuvering, tactical warfare, uh, camouflage and these are trainings and these are skills that they would have been bringing from the continent of Africa from their culture rites of passage to be able to uh, keep the British at bay so we got to um, the point of treat a treaty so they signed a treaty on the 1st of January 1796 if my memory doesn't fail me um, which is something that they celebrate every year that treaty and I went to that celebration this year before the lockdown and uh, witnessed them um, highlighting and celebrating their cultural remembrance. I went to their museum to be able to look at some of the artifacts that take us back to those days and those times and just looking at how their culture has evolved, but yet they still have been able to hold on to various aspects of it and their language to the fact that they now even have their own money, which is printed in Canada and is plastic but they have their own currency in their region. Um, so we've been there, documented that. So that's going to be coming out in some of the, the documentaries that we are working on and putting together. But it's, again, something that we're looking at sharing and expanding so the world can see how we remember how we do things and how we hold on to our cultures. That's Queen Nzinga, Nanny of the Maroons. Then we have Mary Seco. Mary Seco is also from Jamaica. Her ancestry is half uh, African, half Scottish. Um, and she was one of the most famous, well, she is the most famous nurse that we know in our communities. Uh, she taught Florence Nightingale things that she didn't know. And she's coming from a culture where we were dealing with um, different types of bush, different types of herbs and plants that we were learning as we, as we were going along. And our ancestors would have been teaching that onto the next generations of which herbs work well where how what ailments what um sicknesses as they was going along because sickness isn't something new for the world or for our communities but what it is what what we have been doing is we've been adapting and learning about our environments and what from nature can support our our needs um but the reason why i consider this woman to be phenomenal is because she knew she had something to do. She knew she had a purpose and she fulfilled that purpose on her own merit. So she came to England. Again, everybody who comes to this country pays their way to come here. She paid her way to come here and offered her services and they rejected her. But she didn't take that as, as the gospel. She then went on and paid her way and went over to Crimea and developed a, a hostel there to look after our, uh, British troops on the, on the, um, on the Allies' side and went on to continue to support support them. And when she came back, she wasn't issued support when she needed support because of her services. And again, because of her work, she was then supported by her community. And the reason why we know about her is because somebody bothered to document her story. So now at um, uh, St. Thomas's Hospital, opposite uh, House of Commons, there is a statue of her uh, inside St. Thomas's Hospital, which is beside Florence Nightingale Museum, uh, for us to remember her contributions to history and to our to our um, to our community. 
Then we have uh, Yasantawa, Yasantawa, Queen Mother Yasantawa, born 1840, died in 1921. She was a part of one of the last Ang uh, Anglo Ashanti wars. And the reason why she was a part of these wars is because they had taken all the men of the ruling class and they had deported many of them to the Seychelles because they didn't want them to continue the uprising in, um, in the Gold Coast. And uh, she and the other women, other tribe women, um, they went to the other men to say, what are you going to do? And as a result, they weren't doing what they felt they should be doing fast enough. So they called to arms and they picked up arms and they continued that fight, of which led them to also be deported over to the Seychelles because... What a lot of people don't know is the Maroons were sent over. Yes, thank you, the uh, Seychelles. The Maroons were sent over, deported to um, Nova Scotia, Halifax in Canada. Um, so whenever within the regions where the British had been uh, attempting to colonise and, uh, and conduct warfare, they would deport the fighters instead of martyring them by killing them, they would deport them somewhere else so that they would have to start again and have no alliances and no allegiances. And this is what they've done with both of these communities of which we believe that Nani would be coming from the Ashanti region and from that culture. So this, these, this, these are the women that are coming from the West African um, concept and understanding. But again, the women of the men who were deported, they chose to rise up and fight that fight against the British and say, well, we're not going to stand for this. This is not what's going to keep continuing. And they continue that fight. This woman here is Queen Mama Yoko of the Mende people, of the Mende kingdom. She was born in 1849, died in 1906. And she was, was known to have expanded the Mende kingdom within the region that we know today as Sierra Leone. And she is honoured greatly within that culture. Because within Sierra Leone, I think there are about 15 to 18 different tribes that make up the country. And um, this includes the Creole who are coming back from coming from being taken from the continent of Africa and coming from the Nova Scotia regions where the Maroons would have been, as well as where the um, men and women that Harriet, Harriet Tubman would have been bringing up from the Underground Railroad from the Americas up to Canada, as well as many of the uh, West Indian communities who had migrated from the West Indies over to Nova Scotia. Um, so, and they would have been coming over, as I mentioned in last week's video, coming over um, in the early part of the 1800s uh, to be a part of forming the first British colony in 1808 in Sierra Leone. But her conquest comes from continuing to fight and develop within Sierra Leone and pushing forward their cultural narrative, their cultural understandings of how they can come together and create a stronger force. The next woman here, this is Truganini. She was born in 1812 and died in 1876. She is said to have been one of the last full-blooded Aboriginal, um, oh, Aboriginal women, full-blooded um, Aboriginal women taken. So when she passed, she took with her the culture, the language, the, the teachings, um, and everything that was indigenous about her roots and her culture. And the reason why we bring her up is because we talk about the indigenous peoples of Australia, of the Pacific Island, of the Americas. And we look at how systematically Europeans have wiped out bloodlines. They've waged war on uh, families, waged wars on genetics, waged war on uh, cultural um, representation. So when we see culture today, we see it in a bastardised format because there are many people like Truganini who aren't full-blooded to be able to share their culture, their understanding, how they perceive things, how they've lived through things, how they understand things. This is why we talk about her as well as other women. Today, we're just talking about these uh, 16. Um, the next woman here. So bear in mind, I struggle with Marcus Garvey's wife. So today I put in Amy Jacks Garvey. He did have a first wife, Amy Ashwood Garvey, who said that she never divorced him. Therefore, it illegitimized um, Amy Jacks Garvey's, but we don't get into that. We know he had two wives, Amy Jacks, Amy Ashwood. I've put Amy Jacks here. So Amy Ashwood, she um, was his first wife. She came over to this country. Well, they all came over to this country and she helped to found the... Um, Oh my goodness, why have I forgotten this? Um, student Union, West African Student Union with um, uh, Mr. Ladipo 
here in London, she helped them to formulate that. But Amy Jack Scarvey, she was Marcus Scarvey's second wife and gave him two sons. She was responsible for um, the editorial of the Negro World, which was the newspaper founded by Marcus Scarvey for the UNIA. But she uh, pioneered the female section to be able to talk about the African-American, the African, the European black woman and her voice and the fact that her voice wasn't empowered enough that we weren't we didn't have a voice and they made it their business and there are many other women who were part of the suffragettes the african-american suffragettes as well as being here in the uk as well as on the continent of africa fighting for women's rights as we have done for centuries because the inequality between the masculine and the feminine is something that's very rife in the world and it's something that has systematically been put in place to ensure that men continue to have their way and their say and women follow back because we are you know um we are supposed to have come from them, but we all follow different follow philosophies of thought. So I'm not going to get into that right now. That that's what we're talking about. So this is Amy Jack Scarvey. So this wonderful woman here. This woman is also a woman that I I revere a great deal. Her name is Chief Funmali Funmalileo Ransom Kuti. This is Fela Kuti's mum. So Fela Kuti is a Nigerian musician, advocate, um, ambassador for a revolution in Nigeria. This is his mum. So his mum was one of the first women to attend the Abekuta Grammar School in Nigeria. She ended up coming to the UK to go to finishing school in Cheshire. And she went back to Nigeria and founded the Abekuta. Forgive me if I'm saying this wrong. My English, is it ruins everything. But... I'm doing my very best. A women's union to again start to empower uh, women who didn't weren't coming from affluence, women who were coming from affluence to come together to support their needs, their their understandings of what they need to provide for their families. King of Afrobeats, yes, Kuti. Um, she organised many petitions and marches for over ten thousand women to rally to be able to come together and talk about their thoughts and share their opinions and fight for what it is that they truly believed in. And she was an advocate for the women's right to vote. So, creating the same kind of format we see in Europe in um, thank you in Europe um, and the Americas and the West Indies. And we have so many phenomenal women who've always been putting their foot forward of the different classes, middle classes, upper classes, to bring that narrative forward. And then we have this woman here. This is Esselanda Good Robson. This is Paul Robson's wife. So this row here are the wives of many famous people that we know about and talk about. Um, so Esselanda Good Robson was Paul Robson's right-hand woman. She was everything for that man from my perspective. Um, and she helped to propel his career and his, and his, um, and his footprint onto the world. So we're not taking away from what, who Paul Robeson was or what he did. However, the saying is behind every strong black man, there is a strong black woman, but there has to be a stronger black woman behind the men of these women in this row, as well as the top, but in this row in particular, because we know that their husbands more than we know their wives. So Esselanda was his right-hand woman, as was Coretta Scott King for Marcus, Gar Mar Marcus Garvey, Martin Luther King Jr., as well as um, Betty Shabazz for Malcolm X and Winnie Mandela for um, Nelson Mandela. But all of these phenomenal women were wives to men that we consider to be great today. And for them to be great, they would have had, in my perspective, had to have had women who were equally as great and then some to be able to support that drive, support that narrative. Because anyone who's doing something that they're passionate about and they're putting themselves out there into the world, the support is needed on a greater level um, to be able to be sustainable. Because when you're putting yourself out there, not only are you putting yourself at risk, you're putting your family at risk, you're putting your identity at risk, you're putting your, your laurels at risk to, be, to fight for what you feel that you believe in. And that, that partnership, those partnerships are partnerships that we're able to be empowered by today in the future. So you don't just pick, sorry, you don't just pick people for the sake of picking people. These women were able to make and support their men to be what we understand and what we see them of today. Then we have at the bottom, Josephine Baker. So I don't know if everybody remembers the woman in the bananas. So Josephine Baker is the woman in the bananas. She's an African-American woman and she served as a spy in World War II for the French. And she uh, was a singer and actress and entertainer. She would go around the world entertaining the troops, but she would be passing uh, messages backwards and forwards. 
uh, through the through the through the ranks through, because she was a performer. They didn't suspect her of being anything more than a woman or anything more than an entertainer. But she was awarded the Croix de Guerre, which is the highest. I'm working on my French as well. It was the highest is the highest award uh, awarded medal to any uh, serviceman. The Victoria Cross is for this country, and the uh, Croix Croix de Guerre was for France, and she was awarded that. The woman beside her is Lillian Bader. Lillian Bader was born here in Liverpool, in Toxteth. So Toxteth, we know in Liverpool for the riots, the race riots in 1919. And she uh, signed up to the Women's Auxiliary Air Force for World War II. Her dad was from Barbados. Her mum was from Ireland, but her dad served as a merchant seaman in World War I. And he was from Barbados, but she served for this country as well. The woman beside her, is Frances Elliott Davis. So she was a qualified nurse in Washington, D.C., and she uh, couldn't get work. However, uh, in 1917, after years of campaigning and fighting and pushing and showing that she is equal to every and anybody, regardless of Jim Crow, regardless of the racism, regardless of um, all the things that we face as black people, as black women, but she was um, recruited to become a Red, well, the first African-American Red Cross nurse for uh well, during world war one and what also is important is that the red cross nurses their model is what uh, marcus garvey used for the uh universal uh negro um black nurses black cross nurses in the unia the black cross nurses that model was used to be able to provide for the communities in america to provide health care to provide uh, food banks to provide social care, um, basic economical uh, education. Uh, and this is what Marcus Garvey was able to use from that format, from the African-American nurses who were then drafted into the Red Cross nurses to be able to take that formula and move it over into, into his regime, as well as the African-American soldiers into the army regiments that he had created uh, to protect our people in uh, in America and to use that format everywhere else where they were um, where there were factions of the UNIA and this lovely lady here at the bottom is Corporal Olive Waterman she is from Canada she served overseas for Canada during World War II so what I've tried to do is I've tried to give a universal view looking at the continent looking at Europe looking at North America I haven't quite reached South America yet but we're going to get there and the West Indies as well as the um, Australia and the Pacific Islands to be able to draw out narratives that we wouldn't normally hear about because if you're not from these countries you're not going to know these histories unless they are um readily available for you to hear so what we're trying to do with women at war is we're trying to understand how the black woman the african woman is at war and has been uh, we look at the the war the the tangible wars that we can see for these women who have contributed to their countries to their people and how they continue to fight for what they believe in and what they fight for what is right and not because they're you know mere women um we are strong in so many ways so many different attributes so many different uh, faculties and the suppression that we feel you know because being a strong black woman is almost like it's 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 misconceived because Anytime we have moments which are considered to be weakness, it's almost as if, you know, that, that shouldn't happen. But as black women, we're carrying a mental burden of having to be strong all the time, which is causing us great, a great deal of harm and not being able to understand what the, the women in our ancestors face, to let alone to understand what we're facing now, to look at the pressures that we're under, to look at the pressure that our community is under. Because when we look at warfare, it's our children that are being killed. It's our men that are being killed. It's our fathers that are being killed. It's our mothers that are being killed. It's us because we carry that life the seed is what's coming from our men, but we as women, we're carrying that life, whether or not we've had children or not, but we are carrying that life and we're watching our, our race, our people being murdered all over the planet. And we have been for centuries, even before Queen Inzinger in 1583, we're looking at how systematically there's been war waged on our communities and of which that we as black women, we are faced with a great burden from that because we are producing the children that are then being enslaved. We are producing the children that then are being miseducated. We're, mis we're producing the children of children that are being taken because they are gifted to go and elevate another infrastructure which continues to make them feel that they are not good enough. So when we're looking at war, we, we're looking at how 
we can start looking at our history, looking at our contributions, looking at what we're doing so we can work better together using the frameworks that have been gifted to us from those who chose to remember these women. There are so many other women besides these women here that I'm showing you today, but the idea is behind how we start having these conversations, how we start developing this consensus that being who and what we are has to be enough. Being who and what we are has to be sufficient for the time because we're not going to know everything we're not going to learn everything and looking at the educational systems that we're coming from is very very limited and, sy and systematic designed to keep us to be um workers so when you have your own mind you're considered to be different you're considered to be odd but yet we look at many people who run businesses they're considered to have dyslexias and when I was growing up, dyslexia wasn't a term. It was, you know, you was either you were you wore the D or you were uh, put in the slow group or you were put in a different group. And we're always being classified based on trying to fit into one box. And as women, we are regularly put into a box. So if we look at the world and the world tells us that, you know, the white man's at the top, who comes under the white man, the white woman? And then who comes under the white woman? The black man. And then who comes under the black man? The black woman. So imagine if that's the tier, we're at the bottom. When we look at the transatlantic slave trade and we look at the abuse made um, on our people and our communities, when our men are being disempowered in front of us, what does that do to the African woman? What does that do to the black woman? Who does she then regard as a, as, as a man, as somebody who can protect and, and, and provide for her? There's a systematic... I use that word a lot because it, it is systematic from my perspective, um, systematic uh, um, stronghold on our communities that through the trauma and through the abuse and through the genocide and through all of the warfare that we face has led us to be in a state that we're in at the moment. And we're looking at how the rise of mental health is rising with our communities, our women having fibroids, having their wombs removed because, the, because we're so advanced in medicine that we're still unable to work out how African women are... are um, having things like polycystic ovaries and um, fibroids to the fact that they're having their wombs removed, which then denies them the ability to continue to have children or have children in the first place. But what's not being looked at from my perspective is our diets, our um, aversion to healthcare. So from the age of probably 12 to 14, we're already taking pills to control our periods. When you look at that long term, what kind of effects is that having on anybody's systems? When we're looking at the injections, when we're looking at the aversions to condoms, when we're looking at all of the aversions to things that have been created to protect us or to subdue us, what does that do to the African woman? What does that do to the black woman in relation to every other woman? Because when we're looking at scientists and medicine, how often is it that we're looking at it in our best interest and our best, um, and our best, yeah, in our best interests? Because when I was having my son, um, they said to me that, you know, black women have different pelvises to white women. But yet they tell us we're all the same. So if we're all the same, but yet they're able to tell us that the differences between us, how is it that there, there aren't, we aren't creating, because again, I don't wait for somebody else to find a solution for me or to find a solution for us. What I would, I'm not a scientist, so... What I'm asking is, are we looking at how we can deal with ourselves in a better way using a formula that we're able to look at and study ourselves in a way that we can get the best out of what is being created? So that's me for today. Um, thank you so much for joining me. I hope you learned a little bit. Let me get the picture back up. Um, but Black Poppy Rose represents women at war. We don't just represent the men, we represent women, we represent the community, we represent the children. Um, and during uh, the last five years, we have focused on World War One because that's what, what the world was talking about. And as a result, we had to be talking about that strongly in a way for everybody to understand that we also were in World War One and how World War One actually affected our communities and how we contributed our men, our women, our children, our resources, our money, our time, our livelihoods, our futures, to contribute to the British Empire, the French Empire, the German Empire, the Belgian Empire, the Dutch Empire, the Spanish, the Italian, the Portuguese Empire. This is why we have the different pins to um, highlight those languages, because we speak all of those languages on top of our indigenous languages. But what I'll leave you with is if you want to support the work that we do, please uh, go onto our website, donate, patronise, um, promote our works all over social media. 
um, work with us. So if you're interested in hiring us for talks, workshops, courses to book our exhibitions, but, uh, show your, get your inquiries um, to us on the website. It's on work with us. There's, we have a booking form where you're able to let us know what you're looking for and we can uh, let you know when we can deliver and how we can deliver. Um, order your pins, wear them with pride, start the conversations. We need to start talking more. And now with the wave of Black Lives Matters and what's happening, we, we are more open for our conversations. And now it's no longer, you know, oh, we don't need that. Oh, you know, we, what, what slavery was so many years ago. We're looking at the inheritance of slavers. We're looking at the inheritance of all the atrocities that played back years ago to today. That's what we're looking at. And we're looking at how systematically we are um, put, putting more dirt over the things that have happened and we're just keeping it moving. Whereas in fact, what's happening now is that things are growing out of that soil and we're having to deal with what's coming up. So what we're trying to do is open the conversation because there's a lot of healing that needs to take place in our communities. And when we start talking about things, we just talk about them and leave them. What we're trying to do with Black Poppy Rose is not just leave them. We want to try and find uh, actual solutions for us to be able to heal from these traumas from these histories that we're learning so that empowerment doesn't come with um shame that empowerment doesn't come with disbelief it doesn't come with the, the lack of hope that we can get through what we are going through because if our ancestors went through all that they went through and we're still carrying remnants of, of that energy we can still get through this um so if you want to learn more about what we're doing sign up to our mailing list uh blackpoppyrose.org and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you for joining me.